what we'll do today is uh, finish up our discussion on thermal conductivities and then uh, spend pretty much the last few remaining classes uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the epitaxy and the growth of uh, compound semiconductors and compound semiconductor heterostructures. Okay? So, um, um, before that, uh, just uh, another quick uh, point. So we'll have one more uh, assignment, and it'll be of the same flavor as the uh, last one. Uh, and you will have uh, uh, probably two or three problems, which would be um, kind of count towards your uh, uh, the prelims uh, uh, or, or the finals, if you might. So we, we don't have a written final exam for this course. So, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, 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 what we were discussing in the last class was uh, thinking about thermal conductivity, and uh, my plan is uh, perhaps in the, la uh, the, the, the first uh, uh, you know, 20 minutes to half hour finish up this discussion. And uh, uh, what we were, uh, the point at which we were was we were looking at uh, uh, the, the picture of uh, thermal conductivity from the point of view of phonons, of, uh, 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 um, and, and we uh, I had suggested that uh, if you do not have uh, things like anharmonicity, which is non-parabolic behavior of the mass spring system that the crystal is, then uh, it would be uh, uh, actually impossible for heat to be carried in a crystal from one point to another. It will get stored uh, uh, pretty much in the crystal, and there won't be much. Uh, uh, the thermal conductivity would be uh, uh, would be infinite in some sense, right? So it won't have a finite thermal conductivity. And uh, uh, what we what I want to do today is just outline the process in which uh, uh, we end up uh, with uh, uh, an expression for thermal conductivity that I wrote down. Uh, and it's uh, uh, um, so thermal conductivity due to the lattice, which is the phonon based thermal conductivity. Uh, so I wrote it down as uh, uh, some constant uh, times uh, uh, the, the mass of the atoms. Uh, uh, typically, if you have multiple atoms in the basis, uh, it's a it's, uh, uh, average mass, uh, M1 plus M2 by 2 sort of thing. Uh, then there will be a temperature, uh, which is the Debye temperature, whole cubed, third power. Uh, uh, there will be a volume of uh, 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 the, the volume of the unit cell that is associated with one atom. So if you have four atoms, take the volume of the unit cell, divide by four. Uh, so uh, And then uh, volume of that little unit, you can write as delta cubed, so that's kind of the lattice constant of each atom, if you might, you know, the, the, the length scale associated with each atom. And then there's a, a square of this uh, uh, measure of anharmonicity of the crystal, which is the Grunison parameter. Uh, and then there's thermal, uh, the temperature, and uh, there's another factor, which is the, the uh, number of atoms uh, in the uh, basis to the power two thirds. So that those were the, uh, you know, essentially the, the end result. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it comes about from a microscopic picture, but then there are also some, uh, 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 some um, uh, heuristics involved in here, but mostly it comes from the microscopic picture. And from here we can uh, see that the, uh, uh, to get a high thermal conductivity, we need a high Debye temperature, uh, a small uh, denominator ga gamma, this Grunison parameter, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and a small uh, number of atoms in the unit cell uh, or, or in the, in the basis. Okay. So uh, I will, uh, what I'll do, to, uh, to, and, and based on that, uh, what we were uh, kind of looking at is, is if you know these parameters, uh, uh, for example, for silicon, uh, you can see the Debye temperature is about 395 Kelvin. A good measure of what is the Debye temperature is, is roughly, roughly of the order of the highest Acoustic phonon energies. Remember, we talked about so that's that's a, a a physical feel for Debye temperature. Is that the temperature at which pretty much all phonon modes, acoustic phonon modes that actually contribute to the thermal conductivity, get occupied? So if your temperature is that much, then you you know essentially fill most of these states. So so that's a good feel for what is the Debye temperature. So if you look at for silicon, it's about 400 Kelvin. Uh, Grunison parameter is about one. The volume or the length scale associated with each atom is about 2.7 angstroms, mass 28 atomic mass units. So, uh, and you measure the thermal conductivity is uh, about 1.66 watts per centimeter Kelvin, and the calculated is about 1.7, not too far off. Uh, and you see that, that for many compound semiconductors, so germanium uh, has an even lower thermal conductivity. Uh, 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 diamond, uh, you see the experimentally measured value is extremely high. So uh, typically, uh, most of these uh, uh, improvements in theory 
of, of uh, or understanding of thermal conductivity is trying to explain you know why is diamond such a high thermal conductivity and that that sort of thing compared to you see if you if you plug in those numbers and calculate you get only this much but the thermal conductivity is almost twice of that so so there are uh, uh, still uh, the, the, the the concept of thermal conductivity is being uh, um, the theory of thermal conductivity is being developed still but this gives a good fit for many many uh, uh, compound semiconductors as you can see uh, and and then uh, the more wider band gap uh, semiconductors so uh, all these uh, I think you know are, are diamond cubic or zinc blend crystals uh, uh, actually most of them at least yeah and and there the number of atoms in the unit cell is two right number uh, uh, and and uh, so if you go to uh, um, word site sort of crystal structures uh, so this unit cell is basically the uh, if you look at uh, the unit cell we are talking about here, for example, for gallium nitride, it would be uh, the Wurtzite cell actually uh, goes something like that, right? So that would be gallium, let's say, nitrogen, gallium, nitrogen, and gallium. So you can actually you can build a unit cell with one, with just two of these atoms, and that's the really the smallest unit cell. But uh, the conventional unit cell has four, right? And uh, so for n is equal to four compounds, again, you have, you know, you can plug in that formula and here are the parameters uh, and uh, uh, the number of unit cells, uh, atoms in the unit cell can appear here. Okay. So you can plug in those numbers and you get thermal conductivities. Actually, you would notice that silicon carbide, aluminum nitride have very high thermal conductivities. It's, uh, uh, you know, four and three and uh, uh, about about five-ish of the order of magnitude, and that's uh, extremely useful for many devices, for because they can dissipate heat very efficiently. Silicon carbide, aluminum nitride, gallium nitride, for that matter, is a pretty good thermal conductor. So, uh, and, and and so on. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, what I'll uh, do is give you a little bit more. Uh, uh, so, and, and remember, the idea we had was uh, there's optical phonons, there's acoustic phonons. And uh, typically in an electronic or a photonic device, the electrons or the electron holes are dumping energy into the, uh, into the optical modes, right? And then the opticals have to decay into acoustic modes, and the acoustic is what carries heat out, right? And, 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 and so the thermal conductivity, uh, we can write down uh, um, and, and an expression uh, for the thermal conductivity in, in this fashion. Uh, so, uh, just like if I, if I go back to the very basics and I say that, well, uh, my temperature at this point is T plus, uh, let's say, dT. It's uh, slightly higher than at this point, and here its temperature is T. And uh, I have a particle, which could be a phonon, which be a photo, uh, could be an electron, whichever particle it be, be it. It is carrying, uh, it, it's, it moved from this point to that point, right? And with it, it took that temperature and essentially dumped the temperature there, and it moved with a velocity v. Right? And here, when I say velocity, it could be the electron, it could be the phonon. Right? Phonon, what velocity would be for, for, for the phonon? It would be the group velocity, right? whatever is the slope of that acoustic phonon. And, if it, uh, and, and let's say there were n number, small n is the number of those particles, let's say. right? So, so I, I think we know that the total flux, uh, the way we define flux, is just n times the velocity, right? That's how we define the flux. Flux is the number density times the velocity, right? Uh, if you are in three dimensions, the n is one over centimeter cube, velocity is centimeters per second, and you get like one over centimeter square second, right? How many particles are crossing per unit area per time, per unit time? So, so that's the idea. And uh, uh, if you look at electrical current. We, we just say that electrical current will be uh, the flux times whatever I'm interested in. Uh, so in electrical current, I'm interested in electro electric charge. Therefore, electrical current is electric charge times the flux. Right? right? And you get Q times N times V and all that stuff, sort of thing. Right? But here, for thermal conductivity, I'm not interested in electrical current. I'm interested in the energy that is carried by the particle, the heat, right? or the energy. Therefore. Uh, so, so uh, the energy that is carried by, by this particle, by this, let's say one particle, and then we can consider n of them, but by each particle, is uh, uh, so. Uh, I think well, dE is. Uh, I'm going to just write it off the order of 
dt, which is the temperature variation from here to there, the change in temperature, right, times some constant, and this constant is what is called as the specific heat, right? Is that correct? So the rate. Uh, so if if I try to change the temperature of an object, how much energy does it take? dE by dt is 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 uh, actually I'm not going to say the heat capacity. The heat capacity, right? And then, and then, and uh, uh, from here, uh, you get that uh, uh, the, the so this is basically the uh, the uh, heat capacity per particle, not not for the whole, not for the whole uh, n n number, but but for, for for each particle, this is the amount of energy that is going to carry. Okay, okay so. <clears throat> Uh, so, so therefore, if you want to ask what is the heat current, right? Let's call it uh, J U, maybe U being heat. That's my label. Uh, uh, so that's going to be the flux times the energy. Right? Uh, all I need to do is replace the electron charge here by the energy. Right? So, so that's what I'm interested in: the heat current. And heat current will be just uh, N V uh, from the flux. Uh, so let's write it down. Flux times dE. Okay? So that will be uh, n v times the heat capacity. Let's write it as n times c times the velocity times d t. And uh, uh, actually, you can write it equal or approximately equal. I'm making some assumptions at this point. Uh, and and the temperature gradient. I can write it as the following, okay. dt. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I actually have a, an object or the compound semiconductor with a certain length, right? And uh, the temperature gradient is across that length. And uh, so I can write it as the length gradient time time. So so that's that's fine, right? So we can we can do that because we'll be relating it to a certain velocity. And you see the appear, appearance of the velocity again. And this is a time constant. And at this point, uh, let me just uh, re rearrange this a little bit and write that the heat current is, is uh, n times c, the number of phonons or the number of electrons, whichever will be times the specific heat of each. We'll call it a full big C, uh, small, if we go from small c to the, of, of the entire population of, of those particles times, we are got a V and a V here. So you got a V squared, velocity of those particles. Remember, this is very general. Could be phonons, could be electrons, whatever be your heat carriers, right? Uh, a v squared, and then there's a tau. I'm going to call this dt a tau, and I'm going to actually explain what, what I'm doing at this point. I'm making a few changes, uh, dt over dx, right? So, so the way we're writing it now is, is uh, uh, that the heat current is so this dt if the phonon went through ballistically from here to there without scattering at all then the uh, uh, the heat current will actually be uh, le let me explain so 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 uh, if you actually look at electrical currents and if you have a voltage difference between the two ends and you write electrical current as conductivity times gradient of the voltage, right? That's the electric field, and this is the conductivity. Write it this way. Right? The moment you write it this way, you have made an implicit assumption that the transport is diffusive. What does that mean? It means that the whatever particles are carrying your electrical current, which is electrons, they are not going ballistically from here to there. They are scattering off defects and all that. So there's a lot of diffusion and drift and diffusion scattering going on. Only then you can write it in this way. Right? If, on the other hand, the electrons are going ballistically and there's no scattering, the current, electrical current is not proportional to the electric field. It is proportional to the voltage. So, so I think you, uh, if you have taken any uh, courses on, on this, you would realize that the way it's written, for example, current in a ballistic conductor is given by a, a certain conductance times the voltage difference. And this conductance happens to be the quantum of conductance, like 2e squared by h and that sort of thing. Right? So, so, and if you have a number of modes, you have m times number of modes. How, how many waves can you launch into that? So you see that uh, uh, the, if I have a ballistic conduction, 
then the current, be it heat current, the electrical current is proportional to the difference in the potential, not the gradient. Only when you have diffusive transport, we have a lot of scattering, it's proportional to the gradient, which is dV by dx, right? not just the V. Right? In the, exactly in the same way, we are making an implicit assumption at this point that the phonons are going to be diffusive. Right? The moment I wrote it in this way, uh, and, and therefore it will have a finite scattering time, a phonon moves along, and then after every picosecond or five picoseconds, it scatters off another phonon or a defect or something like that, or the boundary of the sample. Okay? And then the phonons, uh, are basically uh, moving diffusively and their ta time constant is tau, very much similar to how an electron moves and it has a time constant of tau, right? Uh, scattering time, very similar, right? So with that, this is our expression for thermal conductivity and if you want to be a little more accurate, the way it should be written is, you know, you, you basically get a velocity of the particle's dot product with a gradient of the temperature and there'll be another velocity term here, right? And this is really a vector, uh, uh, and there's a tau here. Okay. So, so this is how it really should be written. Uh, velocity dot product with the gradient in temperature. So it's a little more accurate. Okay. And, and uh, basically from here, uh, I'm not trying to derive it now, but you get a V square effectively, a velocity squared term, and it can have many angles with this gradient vector, meaning your temperature gradient is along x-axis, but the velocity could be in all kinds of thetas with the x-axis. And you get a cosine square, you average it over a whole sphere, you get a one-third. Okay. I'm not deriving it. Okay. So C V squared tau times gradient of temperature. That's what you're going to get in, in the end. Okay. And, and this quantity... Uh, sometimes the V times tau is absorbed, one of the V times tau is absorbed into a mean free path, mean free path of the phonon or a photon, I mean electron, whatever is carrying the heat. And this quantity, therefore, you see that the heat current is equal to some quantity times the gradient in temperature, and you see it's in this form now, right? right? The current is some constant or some quantity times the gradient in voltage. Here, the heat current is some quantity times the gradient temperature, and therefore, this is what we are going to pull out and call as a thermal conductivity. That's the thermal conductivity, right? This coefficient is what thermal conductivity really is, right? And you see the picture, at least, that it has some assumptions that you have diffusive transport and, and, and that sort of thing. So you can also have phonon ballistic conduction, actually, at very low temperatures, for example. You can get phonon ballistic conduction uh, as well. But that's what we call as the thermal conductivity. Uh, and uh, is that clear? I mean, at least, what did you, um, yeah. And what I'll show now is uh, how does one get from this, this sort of a picture, microscopic picture, to what we wrote down as the expression for compound semiconductors. You know? So I just want to uh, show that uh, just for, um, uh, for, for, for the sake of discussion here. And uh, uh, I want to kind of emphasize also is uh, uh, that, that you know, from the table, if you look carefully, you'd notice that there are Quite a bit of in, you know, I mean, not, 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 things are not as well understood as, as, as I'm making out to be. Actually, there are quite a few unknowns and still a developing subject in itself. Okay, so, so, so that's why I'm kind of trying to cover this uh, next part, which is uh, uh, just trying to show how do you get the thermal conductivity uh, from, uh, uh, from, so this is one way of looking at it, but now if you want to dig into the microscopic picture for this kappa, for this thermal conductivity, the, the approach I'm going to outline is how, how one typically does it. Okay. So, so uh, the microscopic picture is, is actually uh, very straightforward, and uh, 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 what it says uh, is, is the phonon is carried, uh, so the heat is carried by phonons. So, so I have many modes of phonons, right? This is my phonon frequency, omega Q, as a function of Q. Right? Multiply by h bar, get the energy. Right? So that's right? so this phonon frequency as a function of the wave vector of the phonon, and each of these is a mode, right? And so, what would be the uh, the current of phonons? Right? How, how how would you write the phonon uh, uh, current? Uh, the phonon current would be uh, uh, basically if I choose one mode, right? So let's choose this one. It has an energy of h bar times omega q, right? Right? What is the velocity of that mode? Is the slope, right? Whatever is the velocity. So, so uh, what I'm going to write is the energy of that mode Q times the velocity of the mode Q. Right? The group velocity is the slope, right? Right? 
And how many phonons are there in that mole? If the energy is h bar omega q, how many phonons are there in that mode? Can you help me with that? If I had asked you, here's the electronic band structure, and here's the energy Ek for an electron, and I asked the question, how many electrons are in that, mo in that mode or that state? How do you answer that for electrons? Uh, right, so uh, actually, yeah, it's related to the DOS, right? Uh, but uh, what statistics does it follow? It comes from the DOS, actually. You're right. But yeah. Yeah, so for electrons, electrons are Fermi. So they follow the Fermi Dirac distribution. And from the DOS, you find where's the Fermi level, right? And then you write down that the number of electrons in that mode Ek is basically 1 over you know, e to the power energy minus Fermi energy, Ek minus it over kt minus, uh, you know, uh, plus 1, right? That's the Fermi Dirac distribution, right? In exactly the same way, phonons are bosons, right? So they follow the Bose Einstein distribution, right? right? So Bose Einstein uh, distribution, and, and, uh, and the Bose Einstein distribution says that the number of phonons in any mode Q, choose any one, you find its energy, is, is the 1 over e to the power h bar times omega q over k Boltzmann times t minus 1, right? Not plus, but minus 1. That's the Bose-Einstein distribution, right? right? That's the number of phonons in that mode. Right? Now, uh, uh, the question is now, what is that temperature? And the temperature is whatever is your temperature. If you're on the left side, NQ is high, and if on the right side and it's cooler, NQ is low. Temperature. I mean, that's the temp local temperature of that region. Okay. So, so the current is basically uh, um, the the uh, energy of that phonon mode times the velocity times how many particles there are in that in that mode. And what is the number? It's just NQ. Okay. Let's suppose Einstein. And you can look at the units, you get your energy. That's the energy current right? for that mode Q. Right? Now, if you find for all modes Q, you just have to sum over all Qs over the entire phonon dispersion. So all you have to do is sum it over all Qs, and you're done. That's your total energy current from the microscopic picture. It's kind of, I think, hopefully, it's intuitively appealing that it, this is how it is. We're not making some of these, many of these you know, uh, assumptions to get here. This is a classical way, this is a more quantum way, but I think we'll meet somewhere in between, which is semi-classical uh, to relate it to that now. Uh, so you might think that, well, yeah, of course, we know this, right? And we know this. Now, this part is a little tricky because what you have a, you know, this is what you call as the equilibrium uh, distribution, right? Equilibrium distribution, but the problem we are asking is, wait, I'm not in equilibrium because on the left side, I'm in a heat path with T plus dT. Right side, I'm T. So clearly, I have a current flowing here. It's not in equilibrium. Right? Right? So the phonon number, NQ, has deviated from this. It's not in equilibrium. And that deviation is picked up by what's called the Boltzmann equation. Yeah, so, so I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but I'll just say the Boltzmann equation tells you how far have you deviated from this. Right? And the Philosophy of Boltzmann equation is very straightforward. It says that if I have, you know, uh, 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 my NQ is under non-equilibrium, then it's changing with time probably. So, so it's changing with time, d over dt, is some change in time. It could be changing in time because of two reasons. One is, you know, the, the, in, in a certain volume, this is what I'm writing here is a kind of a continuity equation in, in a little bit in a disguise. But uh, the, the way you'd write it is it, it can be changing because uh, uh, the temperature is changing. Right? So you can have d over d temperature right? and uh, times dt. So you could have a change because of the temperature or you could have a generation uh, or, or, or decay. Okay, so let me write it down this way. Over. So every excess mode, so we are trying to find out now what is NQ, and let me just make sure that we are clear, NQ0 is the equilibrium distribution. So NQ0 is the equilibrium distribution. So the rate of change from non-equilibrium is written as this. Actually, there should be a minus sign if you kind of look at the uh, rate of 
change, uh, if, if you are changing with temperature, there should be a minus sign here, just to be clear about that. Yeah. Uh, so, so what's going on? I mean, if you heat the solid, then you have a change in the number of phonons. On the other hand, if phonons are decaying, you know, for whatever reason, I start from here and the phonon starts decaying into other modes. They can also decay into other acoustic modes because of an harmonic interaction. Just like this one could decay into those, this can decay into other modes too. So if, if, if you're losing phonons, uh, then uh, this is the rate at which you're losing. This is the time constant. And if you have done uh, some sort of semiconductor device course, you would have noticed that this is exactly the generation recombination sort of picture. If you have done any fluid dynamics course, this would look very familiar. Right? So, so, uh, and Boltzmann transport equation is very general in that sense. So uh, after things have reached steady state, there is no rate of change of time anymore. This goes to zero. All right? And your NQ from here in non-equilibrium conditions uh, becomes uh, uh, NQ is roughly equal to the equilibrium value plus whatever has pulled you out of equilibrium. Okay, so, so here it actually has a minus sign. Uh, so you can take it to that side, and uh, you get uh, dt, the scattering rate, and right something like that. That's that's a solution of both. Meaning this is a non-equilibrium phonon distribution, is equilibrium, and this is all that has happened because of all these changes, you know, scattering or you know change. Uh, um, you know, generation, recombination, all that stuff leads to this this extra term here. Okay, uh, this one, we can massage it a little bit here and write it as uh, dt over dx again, just like we did there, dx over d time, and then uh, dt over dx. Yes, over dt. What did I do here? Yeah. Should there be another term here? Okay. Right. Something like that, right? So uh, again, from here we are getting the gradient in temperature, right? And uh, there is a, a phonon lifetime. And uh, wait, so this is this is the uh, 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 again at this point you can have ballistic transport or you can have diffusive uh, uh, sort of transport. There's a velocity here, okay, velocity term. And what I'm going to do now is take this, and I'm interested in the heat current. I'm going to just plug that in here and get my heat current. Okay? That's that's what I'm after. I'm after the heat current, and I can uh, you, when you plug that in there. What you end up getting now is h bar omega q times, you know, groove velocity v q, and there'll be another groove velocity term here. So you get a v squared, and uh, uh, there'll be some other parameters which I'm basically not writing right now. But uh, is essentially, okay, let me uh, write this part out. So there'll be two terms first of all, n q zero minus all these new terms. Now the groove velocity of state Q and the equilibrium for uh, Bose-Einstein distribution, this term, if I sum it over all Qs, if I sum it over all Qs, what do I get? Anybody help? Sorry? Yeah. You get a zero. That's right. And the reason is because you know the phonon energy is symmetric with Q, plus Q or minus Q, but the phonon velocity is anti-symmetric, I mean, odd. This, this state is going with plus Vg, this is going with minus. So they're going equal and opposite direction. So, so the, the first term just cancels. All that it physically is saying is that equilibrium, you have some heat current flow in both, but they're exactly equal and opposite in all directions. Right? So, so that's, that's the meaning of equilibrium. There's always heat current, but equal and opposite. So this goes out, only this is left. Okay? And this has a gradient of temperature sitting there, right? You see that? So everything sitting in front, I, and you summing over all Qs, but now I think you probably uh, uh, know the trick. What we're going to do is uh, sub convert the sum to an integral over Qs, you know, just like we did for electrons and DOS and all that. And then pull out this gradient of temperature, and everything that's sitting in the front is going to be your thermal conductivity. That's, that's the microscopic picture of thermal conductivity. And when you do that, you get something like this. This, this is the expression you'll get. 
there'll be temperature dependence, there'll be sound velocity for acoustic phonons, there's a Debye temperature, and this tau is the scattering time that I mentioned of the phonons. And these e to the power x's and all come from, I, I think you would have guessed it, is from the Bose-Einstein distribution. So, so, yeah. I'm not deriving the whole de thing in detail, but that's, that's where, that's the microscopic connection to the thermal conductivity picture. Yeah. And uh, so once you, uh, so essentially once you evaluate it, you get something like this. I'm, I'm probably I'm going to have it in your, uh, one, uh, the last uh, uh, assignment. So, so you can go that step connection to that. Okay. So, uh, uh, so with that, what I'll say is, is uh, uh, the, with the th if you if you take if you measure the thermal conductivity of of various semiconductors in general, what you will get is at low temperature it's going to kind of rise like that. You reach a peak, and then at high temperature is going to go down as one over T. So one over T. So typically, room temperature would be kind of around here, and you would be going down as one over temperature. The thermal conductivity, the lattice thermal conductivity, would be kind of going down like that around room temperature, which is why we have, you know, the, so we are really this formula is only for temperatures that are near room temperature. It's not for low temperatures, but this formula is very general. You can use this to show that at very low temperatures, the phonon hit, uh, the, 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 the thermal conductivity will increase as t to the power thirds. You can see that. In fact, that, uh, it's not a big surprise. The T cube sitting outside, this will go to a constant pretty much at low temperatures. And then when you reach a certain, uh, you reach a peak, and then the, basically there are two kinds of scattering that kick in. Uh, so there'll be a, uh, what's called a umclap uh, scattering, uh, and, and that will lead to a phonon temperature dependence like that and finally at very high temperatures you know essentially you expand it out e to the power theta is a one plus theta by t and it kind of goes like that so so that's uh, so at very low temperatures this is typically related to boundary boundary scattering uh, or, or or you know uh, defect scattering uh, phonon uh, wavelengths can be actually very long especially when you are very small cues this is two pi by wavelength right and very long and it can easily exceed the dimensions of the device itself because we are looking micros, micron scale devices or nanoscale devices now. So the phonon mean free path can be a, a micron, which can be much longer than the size. So it has to scatter. If you have a device like that, the phonon will then scatter from the wavelength is becomes longer than the size of the device. Right? So, so there's boundary scattering and all that. But as you start increasing the temperature, what happens really is, is you, you start kind of uh, the intrinsic pr uh, scattering mechanisms start kicking in and these are this is what brings it down like that it's probably not too surprising if you think about electron mobility in 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 a, in, in a semiconductor at low temperatures it goes down as t, t to about three halves and then phonons kick in and it you know the the, the electron mob in electronic transport this is the th lattice thermal conductivity what i'm just saying is is this has a strong con you know uh, similarity to electron mobility where i think you might have seen this picture many times Right, so at low temperatures, defect scattering lower the mobility. At high temperatures, phonon scattering. So, so phonon scattering is intrinsic. Even if you don't have defects, you're going to have that, right? And then, and, and so this is very similar in some sense. Okay, okay. okay so uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so so you can look at many of these materials from this from this viewpoint. Uh, and here are some experimental data. Uh, so these are for uh, sorry. So this is silicon carbide. Al gallium nitride and aluminum nitride. And you see this behavior, you know, peak going down. Room temperature values for silicon carbide is about 4.5 watts per centimeter Kelvin. Aluminum nitride would be about 4-ish or 3 point some. And uh, GAN is about 2 point something at, or so at, 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 at room temperature. And, and uh, the scattering rate tau that we discussed, uh, Again, uh, if you consider everything goes as uh, boundary scattering, if your phonon velocity is V and the length of the device is L, then V over L is the rate at which it's going to collide with the walls, right, with the edges. Uh, point defects, it goes like that, and intrinsic properties go something like that. So, so this is uh, kind of the breakup. And uh, point defects, so essentially I think you know now that uh, when, when you want to scatter a wave, uh, if the defects are separated by a distance that is of the order of the wavelength, it's the most potent scatterer. If the defect spacing is very small compared to the wavelength, it doesn't scatter much. If the defect is very large, it doesn't scatter either. Right? So, so it has to be that sweet spot. 
And, and uh, so uh, typically point defects are uh, point defects, extended line defects like dislocations, I mean, uh, they all scatter, right? But what is very interesting is if you, if you see, uh, uh, here, here's something you can intuitively answer and your in, the intuition would typically be correct, is, is uh, let's say I have a crystal uh, of a compound or even an elemental semiconductor, right? And uh, I have two kinds of defects. In one, uh, I have a substitutional impurity, you know, so, so, so let's say I have diamond and I, I have nitrogen here, that's it. The other one is, is, a, is, is, a, is, a, uh, the, is a vacancy, the carbon atom is missing. Which one will have a worse thermal conductivity? Substitutional or vacancy? It's hard to say, but what would be the intuitive answer to this, you know, how would one think about it? Any idea? Right. So, you see, uh, yeah, so we are looking at phonons, right? Phonons have to do with mass, right? Mass, so if the change in the mass is larger, it's going to be a heavier scatter. That's the idea. And if the, so, so, you see, the vacancy has, the atom is missing, right? So, it's a very cha large change in delta M, right? The mass. Whereas the nitrogen, well, the mass is different, but it's not that different, right? It's, it's just in a couple of neutrons more or something like that. But this is, the vacancies are very potent scatterers because the mass difference is huge. Similarly, dislocations, I think you know, are dangling bonds, so there's some plane missing or something like that. So they are also potent scatterers for thermal conductivity uh, and so on. And uh, many times what might happen is you, you don't have a vacancy, but you have an interstitial, and that interstitial atom is small that is also a very potent scatter. So what happens is as the heat, goes, heat wave goes through, and it, if it actually interacts with this, basically it, it gets localized. It, it, you know, it's a point scatter. Uh, basically it, it traps the energy of the phonon. So it, it, these are called rattling or rattlers. I mean, many of the low thermal conductivity materials, you intentionally introduce these very weakly bound atoms which can absorb the vibration and, 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 and essentially rattle around and not, not let the heat go through. So these are just like in electronic transport, you have these deep levels, which you know it will capture an electron, trap an electron. Just like that, this will trap a phonon. So, so that's the idea. So you can use these tricks to lower the thermal conductivity, not to improve it, but to lower it. If you want to lower thermal, like thermoelectrics and all that, you can this. Uh, uh, okay. So there are this class of materials which do that. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, the other thing I want to mention is is uh, uh, layered materials, you know, chalcogenides, graphene, boron nitride. Uh, the thermal conductivity is very good in the plane, but it's terrible out of plane. So, so, so it's very good in the plane, as you might imagine. The bonds are strong, and it's very weak bonding. Van der Waals out of plane. So, uh, if you look at uh, graphite, for example, the in-plane thermal conductivity is 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 uh, you know about 10 or 20. It's not too far off. I mean, diamond is 30, so it's pretty good. But uh, the out of plane is 0.06. That's really bad. So, so the so thermal conductivity out of plane is, is, is bad. And you see the, the major difference is not in the masses and volumes of atoms, but really in the Grunison parameter and, and the divide temperature, really. And uh, if you think physically, th this should really be the case because uh, the lattice constant uh, or in the out of plane direction, the lattice constant is very large compared to the in plane direction where the atoms are really close, right? And therefore, if the lattice constant is large, the abelian zone edge is pi over A, so abelian zone edge kind of goes here. And your maximum temperature of acoustic phonon suddenly drops from here to there, right? And therefore, the by temperature drops. The Grunison parameter is a little trickier because you have to think of compression and all that, but both of them get hit in the, in, 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 in the wrong way, and therefore, the thermal conductivity goes very low. <laughs> Similar boron nitride, molysulfide, all that stuff. Same thing, so thermal conductivity has. And uh, again, as I said earlier, don't, don't assume that I'm saying that all this is very well understood. People are still trying to uh, you know, figure out and understand and measure these things. But if you do, the, the currently the measurements and the calculations are, 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 are uh, you know, of, of that nature. And I think you can see there's a huge difference in, for example, just boron nitride. The calculated thermal conductivity is 22 watts per centimeter Kelvin in plane, but the measured is 2 to 3. That doesn't mean there's a bit big discrepancy between calculation and measurement. Well, it looks like that. It's just that people haven't been able to grow good boron nitride, so the quality is very defective and all that right now and things like that. So, 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the last point about thermal conductivity is thermal conductivity is heavily influenced by isotopes. Right? Isotopes are, I think you know, have extra or missing neutrons, right? And because neutrons have mass, right, they affect phonon and thermal conductivity in a strong way. Uh, for example, if you take germanium and you uh, have a normal germanium uh, that you have mined from somewhere, it will have the isotope ratio that was that's close to be what was determined by the Big Bang. I mean, that and the clear creation of elements, right? So, so it has a certain isotope ratio. But if you actually put it in some sort of a centrifuge and you purify it, right? Centrifuge and make the heavier and lighter, you purify it, then your thermal conductivity can improve by close to 30 percent uh, compared to, uh, you know, the uh, non unpurified. And, and then the reason I think is very clear because some germaniums with more neutrons would be heavier than the others. So they are, you know, a delta M, so they're going to scatter the phonons. Right? So that's, that's clear. Right? Um, but what's very, you know, very striking is if you go to diamond, you get 30, 40% improvement. And these are, these are experimental. Silicon, you get 60%. Still, people have a hard time explaining because the theory is only saying it should be 12%, but you're seeing 60%, a very large increase in isotope. Isotopically enha enhanced materials have much higher thermal conductivity than you would kind of predict from existing theories. Okay. So there's some opportunity to try to understand that. And all. Uh, but uh, the most interesting thing is if you go to boron nitride, the, the, the predicted, this is predicted model, uh, is basically saying you're going to more than double your thermal conductivity if you go into isotopic purity and all that. So these have been not measured yet, so people haven't been able to grow good boron nitride to be able to so as you, as you might imagine, this is assuming a perfect crystal. It's a perfect crystal with no, very few point defects and, and that sort of thing. So a lot of un, uncharted things as well in, in, in this picture. Uh, but I, I, I want to also emphasize before I end the discussion on thermal conductivity uh, uh, that pretty much every state-of-the-art uh, device technology, uh, be it the CMOS for digital logic, be it RF for radars, for cell phones, uh, be it uh, uh, lasers for communication, heat is a big problem now. Meaning, you know, even though they're operating 50% or 80% efficient, the rest is heat. And so getting the heat out is a big problem, and therefore finding high thermal conductivity materials that can efficiently dissipate the heat is, is a very, very important thing. In fact, if you can build your entire technology on a platform like that, which already starting with a high thermal conductivity is great, because then, you know, uh, you, you, you. Uh, so, so the thermal part was typically, for many years, used to be an afterthought, meaning you make a device and it's like, oh, I have too much heat, so I need to get it out now, right? So it was more of a damage uh, mitigation in the end, right? But now you can, we have the opportunity also to, to be able to design the device, both from an electrical and photonic aspect and the thermal aspect together you know, from, from the beginning, so, so that's. Uh, Okay, good. So I'm good. that's all I have to say about thermal conductivity and heat. Any questions? Well, okay. If not, let's move on then to the, uh, uh, to the next topic, which is epitaxy. And I'm going to just uh, start with a uh, couple of slides I've already used before. So we'll start with uh, the growth. Uh, and uh, we had discussed uh, quite a few aspects of growth earlier. And what I want to do today is... Uh, we have about roughly half hour left, so what we'll do today is, is uh, uh, kind of track uh, uh, for the particular growth technique of uh, MBE, and then we'll talk a little bit about CBD later. But we want to get into, the first thing we'll do is look at the growth, uh, 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 you know, the development of the growth equipment and the science. You know? And then uh, look at a little bit about if you, you know, throw a lot of atoms on a surface, how do they move? Do they form steps? Do they form, you know, are the steps straight? Do they turn? How do they turn? All of that can be actually understood from a very simple thermodynamic picture. Very simple. And I want to kind of at least throw that out first. But uh, at the same time, what I would say is uh, uh, the growth uh, is, uh, still remains a heavily, heavily experimental science. Meaning uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, many theories still have a hard time predicting the outcome of growth is because growth has phenomena, physical phenomena occurring at many time scales. There are bonding and uh, breaking of bonds and, and, and connection of bonds going on at femtosecond, picosecond time scale, 
and then the atoms can diffuse from one side of another to at second time scale. So you have 18, 14 orders of time scale phenomena and every one of them is important. It's not like there's one rate limiting step here. You know. So therefore, it's a multi-scale problem, which is why theoretical models, many of them, there are many beautiful theoretical models and I'll actually capture one or two of them at least, just to give you a flavor. But uh, uh, so there's a lot of opportunity trying to understand the science of growth. Uh, but what I'm saying is because the underlying phenomena is reasonably complicated uh, and the physics, most of the building blocks are understood. It's not like we don't understand the building blocks. It's just that once you put it together, it's, uh, the, it becomes highly multi-scale and, and the uh, analytical approaches can give you some guidance, but the and computational approaches really uh, are limited right now in what they can predict in terms of the dynamics of growth. Okay, but what we'll do is discuss it from an experimental perspective first and then start looking at a few uh, ideas. And uh, one of the things I want to start with is, is uh, uh, we talked about molecular beam epitaxy, right, a little bit earlier when we were talking about sources uh, and it's essentially being a vacuum system. And uh, uh, in fact, I had planned, let me see, uh, I, I, you know, this is, uh, let me see if this works first. You know, so. Where is... Maybe not. <laughs> okay. You probably have don't need this, but I'm going to do this anyway if it works. That is. <laughs> All right. So, volume. Let me just see if it works. No? Nope. Can you hear anything? You can? Oh, okay. So uh, just a very brief uh, intro of uh, MBE. Uh, and it's hard to see though, right? So uh, this is from uh, the slightly outdated, but from uh, Sharp Laboratories, uh, where they actually make lasers and transistors using MBE. And it's just one of the managers talking about MBE uh, and, and what it does for them. Um, and uh, I, I think we'll, we'll kind of, I just want to get started from here. I'll post these links on the website and all you can have a look. But let's just see what, what he's trying to say if we can hear it then. This is an MBE machine. MBE stands for Molecular Beam Epitaxy. Epitaxy layers. And molecular beam means that we can create layers with molecular precision. Sharp was actually the first company to mass produce lasers for CD and DVD. Um, and those lasers for CD and DVD were actually made using mass production in the system. Well, molecules are very, very small, so typically about a billionth of a meter in, in length. We can deposit layers of material with a precision of maybe a billion of a meter. For research, we can investigate a lot of different types of devices we can use these kind of techniques. So, for instance, lasers, LEDs, solar cells, and ultra fast transistors. Basically what it is, is a chamber with a very, very high vacuum. So a vacuum like there is in outer space. Inside this chamber, there are basically no atoms, nothing. It's just empty space. And what we do is we take the molecules that we want to build these layers with, we load them up in like guns, and we fire bullets of molecules across this empty space. They land on this substrate, and we can do that one molecule at a time. So to make the device, of course, we don't use one molecule. What we need to do is build up these layers. And we can do that one molecule at a time with absolute control. And that absolute control allows us to create the, the kind of functions and properties that these devices need. To create this ultra-high vacuum, we use two things. One, we use vacuum pumps to suck everything out of the chamber. Uh, but that will only get you to a certain level, it doesn't get you to the level of outer space. What we need also is right at the center of this chamber, we make it extremely cold, so we fill it with liquid nitrogen, we 
very, very cold. Um, and what that does is, is it sucks material, particularly impurities, out of the chamber and they land on this very, very cold surface. Once they're on the cold surface, it's a bit like sticking your thumb to an ice lolly, they won't come off anymore. So they stay on that cold surface and that creates the, the really high vacuum that we need to make the system work. That's important in the MB because uh, we have to be careful of impurities for electronic devices. Impurities really kill the, the properties that we need in an electronic device. When you're mass producing the electronic devices, you need many, many devices, millions of them every day, and so we need a much bigger chamber. The main devices that Sharp used in mass production were lasers um, or CD and DVD, and there we need a much bigger system, and that was used by Sharp for many years to make and, and supply the world with CD lasers. Okay, good. So that was a bit of a advertisement for themselves as well, but uh, 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 it gives you a fair idea of what uh, uh, what sort of devices uh, you know companies are using. And uh, so what I want to do is first demo, uh, or rather show you a couple of things uh, from the MBE system, and we'll go about it from a slightly historical perspective. So uh, you, you saw the system. It's it's a high vacuum system, and it has all these sources for gallium, aluminum, you know, indium, dopants, tin, uh, uh, phosphorus, whatever you need, right? Uh, so these are elemental sources, uh, and essentially uh, you are evaporating materials onto a substrate, uh, and there's a reed gun and all that. So we'll discuss all those things later. Let's look at the source first. And the source is typically uh, 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 what's called the effusion cell. So it's, it's going to uh, uh, as he said, you're going to spray paint or you're going to boil off atoms by heating it. Okay? And uh, uh, so the effusion cell, uh, the history is actually very interesting. Uh, so it's about uh, mid-60s, uh, around that time, uh, 1960s. Uh, the effusion cell, uh, uh, so in, in a certain sense, MBE uh, came about because of the confluence of two very distinct areas. One was surface physics. Surface physics was essentially people were bouncing off stuff from surfaces, electrons or neutrons, and looking at the uh, crystal structure about the bonding on the surface. Uh, they built incredibly precise tools, uh, such as uh, the uh, quadrupole mass spectrometer. If you, you know, basically it says four electrodes with uh, certain voltage differences, and any atom that goes into it, you can basically fingerprint it. You can say this is a gallium atom, it's a nitrogen atom, or something like that. Right? So that's a quadrupole mass spectrometer, and essentially uh, uh, surface physics was mostly involved with trying to understand uh, the physics that goes on on surface. If you deposit something, if you evaporate something, what comes off? You know, if you have a compound semiconductor, what comes off first? You know, when you heat it, uh, do all, both atoms come out at the same time and all that sort of thing. So that was surface physics, which has de developed all these nice tools around uh, mid-60s, and the other area, which is very unrelated, is, is, the, is the NASA space program. In the space program, what they were developing were things like this. This is actually, looks like MB source, but actually this is, uh, uh, this is what uh, was used uh, uh, for ion propulsion. And ion propulsion is a, a technique which was developed uh, uh, in, for the space program where you have the rocket lift off and all that. And now, once you're in space, for example, for uh, you know, for example, if you take uh, if you take a, a source like essentially, if you take any object, and I think you know that in in space there's very little friction, right? So if you uh, essentially shoot out ions from here, then there'll be a recoil. And on the Earth, it's not not a very big change, but in in a space where there's almost no friction, then this thing will kind of start moving. Right? So. And, so uh, these uh, sources were actually developed, uh, cesium-based ion sources. Uh, uh, it comes from the space propulsion systems. Ion beam sources were developed for altitude control, uh, you know, where you are so essentially precisely handling your height, uh, station keeping, and changing the orbit, and all that sort of thing. So a, and I think you can imagine why one would do it this way, because electrical control is extremely fast and extremely precise compared to all, all the other possibilities. Okay? So you can, you know, turn, move very, very fast and very accurately. You can have a feedback control, right? Feedback control is extremely important and if, you, if you want to correct yourself. So that, that, that sort of precision is very important. And so it was developed initially with uh, CCM ions. CCM, I think, uh, I think you know, has a very low 
uh, essentially it, it ionizes very easily at low temperatures. So essentially what you do is uh, pass some current, heat it, and you know, ionize it, and it, it goes, and then it creates the back reaction, and it, that, that's what it was used for. So this is a fusion cell that was used for cesium ion beam experiment, uh, th and some of this was developed uh, uh, at uh, uh, companies like TRW, which were contracted out by NASA for, the, for their programs. You know. And so one of the early pioneers of MBE, uh, Al Cho, was involved very, you know, actually he kind of developed this in, 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 in NASA, okay? so in, in, in TRW and all that. Okay? So uh, if you look at that and you look at a modern MBE source port, this is how it looks. It's actually exactly the same design. There's nothing has changed other than some, you know, more precise controls and then stuff like that. So it's a fusion cell and, uh, well, with, rather than showing it there, we brought over one because we do a lot of MBE at Cornell, right? So here's the fusion cell, uh, for example, and this is just the cap, so let's remove that. Uh, so I think you can see uh, the nature uh, of the cell. Uh, these are, uh, there's a thermocouple here that measures the temperature of whatever is sitting there, and there's a heat supply that supplies the heat, right, to melt and, and to uh, create the beams. So if you look, uh, this is a radiation shield, it's a tantalum foil. And the tantalum was found critically useful for, for this space program. I mean, that's where it was, there's a tinier tantalum foil on the top there. Uh, this is now a little longer. And uh, uh, so, uh, so essentially the, you have the heaters and the thermocouple. Uh, if you look inside, I don't know whether it's easily seen for you, but there are all these wires that go around and they, you pass a lot of current and it heats, it heats, heats up. Right? And then once it heats up, you have gallium or uh, you know, any of these uh, sub, uh, elements in it. Uh, it will uh, melt and it will evaporate. Uh, and uh, as you evaporate, you get the molecular beam so as it goes out in the vacuum. Now, uh, the way it's connected to uh, the, the, the MBE system is, is through, uh, so it's, it's ultra high vacuum. And wait, where is my gasket? I'm looking for the gasket here. Here we are. So uh, there are generally uh, gaskets here that uh, clamp onto the system, and uh, and then you tighten bolts. And essentially, these are somewhat flexible metals, copper typically, and you have knife edges that kind of bite into the copper, and that avoids leakage of gas from outside. That's what enables uh, high vacuum. If you just have a normal, so essentially to get ultra high vacuum, 10 to minus 11 or so on, you uh, you, you have to have uh, you have to have a pretty much a metallic seal. But you can't weld it because you've got to open it sometimes. So that's how we use a gasket, uh, which was here. And I don't think gaskets generally evaporate, but <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> uh, anyway, OK, so, uh, so it's just a ring of copper. So, so that's it. OK, good. So now uh, inside this, uh, we're going to put the crucibles. And the crucibles are uh, typically made of uh, pyrolytic boron nitride, or PBN. And I have a couple of them to show. Uh, here's, for example, a crucible for, uh, this is a PBN crucible, pyrolytic boron nitride. Uh, and uh, essentially it's kind of powder and then sintered very heavily and then this is how you make it. And it can sustain very, very high temperatures and doesn't degas much. Yeah, so, so you put gallium in there, aluminum, you know, indium, and uh, uh, you know, put it inside the source port, heat up and get your molecular beam flux. So, yeah. Uh, now the PBN is also very important uh, uh, because uh, the the um, so uh, you can actually it's possible to use metals sometimes and uh, for extreme cases sometimes you have tantalum liners and all that for for but PBN is also a very boron nitride is a good thermal conductor too so, and uh, I think you probably know the reason you know boron nitride has. Uh, 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 larger band gap than visible light, but this is a powder, so that's why it kind of looks white. I think so, so it's it's uh, it, it as, as, as all the light, it's not transparent, but uh, uh, it has like uh, for so th that's for typically for elements. You know, if you're growing gallium arsenide or silicon, for example, or indium gallium arsenide, the metal would go in here, right? And sometimes the group five also, if it's a solid, can go inside your solid sources. For dopants. We are typically using smaller ones because you don't need too much ma matter, right? So a dopant, sometimes even the material, you know, main material is also, this is a conical cell, right? And the shape of these two, 
cells uh, are designed in a way to maintain uniform growth. So you see on the top here, it also starts getting a little conical shape. Yeah? And the reason for that uh, is, is really you want to have a certain uniformity on a wafer that's placed somewhat far away. And the design here is such that the atoms, as they get around and they bounce back and forth and they get out, you have a certain you know, uh, broadening of the, uh, of the, of the beam. And, and, and uh, as it broadens and it goes and hits the substrate, if you have various designs, you kind of, it shows uh, you can, you can uh, uh, typically you have like a 1 over cosine theta cube dependence as you go away from the center of the wafer. And therefore, uh, if, you, if you have a cylindrical and then if you kind of make it conical, it gets much more uniform. And then it's, so the larger the wafer, the more importantly, you have to think about how to design these things. But you know, that's, so essentially, this goes inside the, uh, the top of that uh, source port. Uh, and then you, know, you, you basically heat it and, and get going you know, with the growth. It's uh, r rather uh, simple, but uh, uh, sometimes, uh, actually many, it's very rarely uh, pointed out in books and all that it really came from space programs, which is very interesting, and surface physics. So, uh, uh, so we have to bolt down the MB to the ground so that it doesn't fly off or something. <laughs> Not really, yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, but it, if you go to the lab, it looks like it, it could. You know? So, uh, okay, so uh, if you look at uh, some of the earliest experiments, this is uh, one of the early experiments by Al Cho and uh, 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 and and uh, Hendrix uh, uh, at Illinois, uh, and he's uh, essentially uh, one of the first papers that that really talks about a very important concept in MBE growth. You know, once you have the substrate and you essentially evaporate stuff, and then uh, it lands on a surface, right? You take a substrate and it lands on that surface. So the atoms hit the surface. Uh, by the way, uh, these details of things like uh, 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 the vacuum here, we will come back to that later. So the vacuum level mm, determines what, how many atoms are there in this, in this gas here. Right? Uh, but once it lands on the surface, uh, 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 we, uh, now whether it stays here or it bounces off is an important question right, for growth. So you know, you're throwing balls at a wall, Balls don't stick, right? It's bounce off. And most of the atoms, that's true. It doesn't stick. It, it, it is. And, and this, this thing was first really uh, captured as a sticking coefficient. Nothing very fancy, but the way it was measured is, is shown in this paper. Uh, uh, and what they're doing is uh, <clears throat> so the way they're doing the measurement is they have an oven, they're basically boiling off atoms, and then uh, 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 there's a shutter and all that stuff. We'll discuss those things later. But essentially, uh, once uh, it, 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 it goes and hits a substrate, there's a tungsten substrate here, right? It hits there. So either it gets absorbed or it gets reflected. And if it gets reflected, they can collect it here and, 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 and detect it. Make sense? So if you know your 100 atoms went in and only two, two came out, then you know your sticking coefficient. Right? 98 percent, right? something like that. And that's what this is saying. So whatever came out was collected by the ionization by whatever went in, right? This is a sticking coefficient. And that's how they define it. Uh, the way you can also measure it very accurately is, is basically you look at the flux that you're measuring of atoms here. The moment the shutter opens, you have a sudden jump because many of them are getting reflected. And then it kind of gradually, you have a certain deposition rate here. And, it, and then it kind of drops again. Th this is the flux that is being measured by this ionization gauge, for example. As an, when you, you don't really measure flux, you then kind of cascade this through. There's an electron multiplier, and you measure a current in the end. You, do, you don't measure flux. You measure a current. And so the sticking coefficient is basically the ratio of 1 minus A over B. And this, uh, for example, would have about 50% of sticking coefficient, this picture, because this is roughly half of that. And uh, so they uh, first kind of defined this picture. Uh, and you can go in, and the Rocket's book has a little bit of description of uh, this, that, uh, uh, of this physics of this. And you'll have, uh, essentially, on the surface, uh, you'll have the energy uh, coordinate of the crystal, I think, of, of any atoms, I think you know, kind of go like that, right, uh, near the surface. I'm not getting into that right now. We'll, we'll discuss that later. But it is sticking coefficient. And then once it, uh, uh, a little bit 
a uh, few years later after this paper 69 I think around 1970 itself uh, so John Arthur who was another pioneer of MBE what he was doing was looking at the sticking coefficients for 3-5 semiconductors compound semiconductors for gallium arsenide specifically and what he sees is the same curve that uh, Alcho introduced and what he sees is uh, uh, if he's depositing uh, let's say okay so here's a gallium arsenide uh, substrate or he could even have a other substrate doesn't have to be gallium arsenide so if he is, is depositing arsenic and uh, uh, um, if there is you know no gallium on the substrate then your experiment there goes pretty much like you know something like that meaning your sticking coefficient is very low this is B this is A and your flux that you're measuring or, or stuff everything is bouncing off that's that's what he was measuring uh, and it didn't depend too much on temperature and all that but the moment he had some gallium here you know meaning deposit gallium at the same time right simultaneously if you have gallium here and you are at around 450 to 500 degrees C uh, then what he notices is this curve changes in a very sharp way it starts basically the A goes to zero it goes up and then it immediately kind of goes back to zero here. What that tells you is basically the A0 sticking coefficient is one. Meaning every arsenic atom you're throwing now, or you know, or in, you turn it around, every gallium atom you're throwing now is going into the it sticks now. So that was one of the first, uh, uh, so this was uh, John Arthur, another pioneer, and then that, that essentially uh, uh, said that there's a very interesting way of growing a crystal now because before that I mean crystal growth was you would melt gallium melt arsenic and try to put them together in the same crucible and maintain you know, some sort of pressure and temperature to grow a bulk crystal this still used for liquid phase I mean large scale but for epitaxy this is way out of equilibrium way out of thermodynamic equilibrium but it still grows and it grows beautifully meaning very nice layers and all that sort of thing so so this was uh, 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 one of the first experiments that uh, kind of set of the MB growth uh, technique, you know, in, in the late 60s, so these these experiments, so sticking coefficient, uh, and and uh, you can see that uh, the the uh, and and around that time there was a kind of very strong need for high efficiency electronic devices and optical devices for many programs and you know industry as well. So it kind of was a nice confluence of uh, very unrelated topics, this you know space program, surface physics, and they combined together you know the fact that it could measure these things was a result of surface physics the fact they could produce these beams was a result of uh, uh, a result of uh, another a space program and, and I think it's a very nice confluence the, the, the program was not to develop MB you know but but to it came from other sources from very different directions okay, okay so uh, now once the atoms land on the surface uh, what we can do is uh, or rather once they stick we can now look at uh, how do they move around on the surface and that's where we kind of start looking a little bit into the details of the growth okay? and we have a few minutes so let me just outline the pr process we are going to look at okay? and each of these things we can now kind of precisely measure as the growth occurs okay? so when you have a surface typically this is a nice picture of a surface it's a simpl simplified picture it's saying that well a surface of a semiconductor crystal uh, you'll have two flat terraces, you'll have steps like this, you'll have extra atoms, add atoms that will be, you know, uh, that may be landed here and they're moving around. Right? Uh, sometimes the steps are not perfect, you'll have a kink here. This is a little break. Uh, I think everything should be now self explanatory. If you have an add atom, but if many of them cluster together, you have a cluster of add atoms. Right? If you have a missing atom, it's a vacancy. If you have a cluster of vacancies, you have something, a hole like that, right? And what we'll see now is, is just from this very simple picture of once you land atoms on a surface, you know, uh, how do they move around? And is very strongly, as you might guess, dependent on the temperature of the substrate. Very strongly dependent on the substrate temperature. Right? This is, uh, atoms we're going to diffuse and all that. And uh, from actually a rather simple picture, you can see a lot already about what will dominate. Will, will there be kinks? Uh, will there be a lot of steps will there be you know will the steps be straight whether they'll wander whether there'll be bunching of steps all that sort of thing you can say a lot by very simple thermodynamic arguments let's do one today and then 
kind of look at a couple of them late in the next class. And uh, 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 okay, so let's just do one of them today. So this is a very nice uh, picture. I like it because it gives you a very intuitive feel for what growth uh, typically, uh, what, what sort of you know physics is occurring during the growth. And what we'll see as we discuss these things of gro about growth, of the physics of growth, is at a certain level you can think an ad atom or a king, if you can think of a kink here, if it's going to the right, you can think it of a, I mean, it might sound weird, but you can think of this as an electron and that as a whole. It's very interesting. You can start thinking of it that way because all the equations we're going to get about how many kinks are you going to form, how many left going and right going kinks are form, are look just like the electron hole physics of semiconductors. And uh, we'll see that the number of left going and right going kinks, the product of them is like a NP is equal to NI squared. It's going to look all like that. You know? Uh, whether a step will be straight, whether it will wander to the side edges and all that, we, we can actually uh, write down uh, quite a few expressions that will predict these things. Right? And uh, they give you a guidance then, you know, uh, about, about the physics of growth. So then let's just look at this one and we can end it here today. So uh, here's the picture. You have, a so you have a surface, let's say it's atomically flat, uh, no uh, steps, no kinks, none of that, completely flat, atomically flat. and uh, and you land atoms on it now, and you want to ask whether it's going to form something like this or something like that. Right? What is this? This is basically a, mostly a flat surface, but a little, but a step, right? and, and there's some holes in it, or, or add atoms and vacancies. This is, on the other hand, very different. I think physically you can see the difference. This is a rough surface. There are no steps. There are no terraces like that. It's rough surface, right? and. Uh, the picture here is uh, once the atom lands on it, you can think of these as uh, this, the uh, the picture we are using here is everything is a cube. It's a cubic crystal, and the atoms are cubes. They land on the surface, and let's say the bond energy of each of these bonds uh, in a, is is W. That's the energy, give or take a couple of EVs, one electron volt or something like that. W is the energy of the bond, and once it lands on the surface. Uh, uh, what we're going to ask now is, is I have a surface like that. Uh, let's look at it somewhere inside. Here, here's my atom, or, or the add atom. Uh, now, we're going to say that the coverage of the surface is theta. Fraction of the surface that's covered with such atoms is theta. So I have supplied you know, a certain number of atoms. And I'm not supplying anymore. I've certain supplied some, and I can, I'm letting them wander around, do, do their thing, and reach thermodynamic equilibrium now. So I have only supplied a fraction theta of atoms, meaning, well, if theta is 30%, then I've only applied, you know, supplied atoms that will only fill one third of the surface, right? not all of it, right? And now the question is, how are they going to arrange themselves? And that's what we're trying to answer. Thermodynamic. If you have a temperature of T, how does it arrange themselves? So if the bond energy is W, so one atom can bond to four on the side, on each side and one at the bottom, right? right? Uh, is that clear? So, so it can bond to four on the, on the side and one at the bottom. And uh, the total energy of each add atom, U, uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, add atom, we're going to find what is the total energy. Uh, remember, the energy obviously has very many scales, there's nuclear energy, all that stuff, but we are interested in energy that is gained or lost by form, forming bonds or breaking bonds on the crystal now. So that's the energy we're interested in. The, you can ask for each add atom, what is the total you know, uh, energy involved? And we'll now show that it's basically, if the bond energy is W and the fractional coverage is theta, then the, it is four times W times theta times one minus theta. And you can show that. And that's the total energy cost. Uh, energy of the add atom. Not energy cost, but the energy of the add atom. The way to look at it is the following, that, that if you have uh, one add atom landed, it had basically six possibilities of forming a bond. And uh, the, the fact that it formed a bond with the bottom surface doesn't count because it, uh, um, so, so the, the, the bottom, uh, the, the atom which was underneath it had a dangling bond, it had a certain energy, right? Uh, and uh, every time you have, form a chemical bond, you lower the energy. The reason to form a chemical bond is you lower the energy. 
and if you have a dangly bond, it's slightly higher energy. So essentially, uh, the picture, to, uh, the way to look at it, this bond doesn't count because whatever this loss, that gained in some sense. So there's no change really. All the changes are because of the bonds it can form to the side now, and that's 4W. You can get 4W is the amount of energy that that atom has that it can lose or gain or whatever. I mean, it it can basically, if it forms a bond on the side. Here it will lower this two system will lower its energy by W and, and, and so on. So that's the picture to look at, and uh, uh, the uh, if the fractional coverage is theta, then uh, um, okay. Actually, I'm a bit over time today, so let's actually. Carry, I'm going to maybe it's a good point to end. I, I'll just leave it here, and th on Thursday we carry on from here and show why the energy of that is that much. And then we show there's an entropy term, and then when you combine the two, you will get under a certain temperature, you will get phase separated. Above a certain temperature, you get this. So a roughening versus a phase transition, and then you can show that. And from here on, we will make it a, mo a little more interesting. We'll say, well, if I have a step, how, how does it happen? I mean, what does it do? So you have a step, and you can show that the step wanders and all that as you change the temperature. And you can see these things. Uh, so, so I'll just outline the philosophy of this, how to think about this, and then move on with the growth. I mean, I'll, I'll basically outline just the philosophy of how to think about these things. Okay, okay good. Let's end it here. I think we're out of time today. <clears throat>